So we're going to have now, we're going to hear for about Dave Zyron. I don't know. Well, let me ask, is, is anyone surprised that the nation covers sports? Do you think we would? Raise your hand if you think it's a little odd. Yeah. All right, no, no, be honest, because when, when Dave, odd. there's no reason you should know this, but the nation is uh, one of America's oldest magazines that has been publishing continuously since 1865. The first issue was published in July 1865. It's been published ever since. When Dave was hired, I believe it was 2007 or 2008, he was the first sports editor in the history of the magazine. So it's a long time we didn't have anyone doing sports. Uh, when he was first hired, no joke, Katrina s tells us better than I, she got nasty letters like, what, you're wasting your space on sports? Why are we, that's frivolous. What are you going to be doing, fashion next? I mean, we, we heard this stuff frequently. After about, I don't know, six months, a year, Dave's work had been out there. People had a chance to see what he was doing. Never got another letter like that again. Now we get letters, no joke. You know, who, you got to give this guy more space. Why did he write more for you? We ask him, Dave, why don't you write more? He said, I can only do three times a week. So we get as much out of him as he can, but, but he really has has been at the forefront. Uh, uh, I don't know there's anyone in the country, or I know for sure there's been no one who has taken the intersection of politics and sports and put it together in a way like Dave has. He started doing this before, well before Colin Kaepernick, well before the wave of protest has been hitting the sports field. He was really ahead of his time. Now every political publication covers sports. You can't afford not to. Dave saw that coming, and we were really proud to sort of have him as part of the nation. He's written, I thought he'd written like eight books. He's actually written 10, because uh, he does like two a year, and they're all really good. So I would encourage you to check him out. He also, I don't know how he finds the time, but he, he also hosts a weekly podcast. It's called the Edge of Sports Podcast. You can hear it at thenation.com, also on Sirius. I would encourage you all to look it up. I don't have much time, but I always listen to this. And I happen to be a sports fan, but even if you're not, it's um, well worth listening to. I have a lot more to say about him, but I should probably, he, he's more interesting than I am. So I'm just going to give him the floor. He's going to talk for you know, roughly about 15 minutes. Then again, as we've done previously, we really want to hear from you. So we have some time set aside with these two mics for you to come and ask whatever questions come to mind. We hope you take that opportunity. Um, so again, I'm proud to introduce my friend and colleague, Dave Zyron. Hey, thank you. I figured I'm going to stand until I pass out. Uh, it's been a long couple of days. He so woke up at 3 in the morning in Chicago just to say that. So, But he, he's you know, as dynamic as Thank you. Oh, <laughs> before I speak, thank you, Peter. Um, so. Before I start, it's just good for me. I don't care who I'm talking to, uh, young journalists, uh, senior citizen home where I spoke last month. Um, I did want to ask everybody here, uh, how many of you consider yourselves like diehard sports fans? Okay, we got a couple. How many consider yourself a casual sports fan? Like you sort of know what's happening, but you know, that's about as far as it goes. And how many of you would rather shave your head with a cheese grater than hear somebody talk about sports for a while? Okay. Fantastic. What's your name, if I could ask? Mallory. We didn't meet before, did we? Okay, that's was totally confusing. Oh my God. Two Mallories. Well, the goal for this little talk today is to do something that appeals to the diehard sports fan, the casual sports fan, and Mallory. If I can get that done, then we'll have accomplished something here. Um, I grew up one of those diehard sports fans. I grew up here in, in New York City. Um, and I never gave much thought to the politics of sports at all until about 1996 when a basketball player named Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, who I was able to meet in person for the first time, thanks to Melissa Harris Perry at Wake Forest University, which I will always be grateful to you for because he is an absolute hero of mine. Mahmoud Abdul Raouf is a basketball player for the Denver Nuggets who made the private decision that he was not going to stand for the national anthem before games. Does that sound familiar? And uh, Mahmoud Abdul Raouf was asked why he did this. And he said, well, I'm just not comfortable with the conflation of the national anthem and a sporting event. And uh, the journalist, like all good journalists do, had a follow-up question ready and said, yeah, but don't you realize that that flag is a symbol of freedom and democracy throughout the world? And if you ever find the footage of this, you could see that Raouf has this glint in his eye where he's like, should I say something? I think I'm gonna say something. And he, so he pauses like this and he says, well, it may be a symbol of freedom and democracy to some, but it's a symbol of oppression and tyranny to others. 
And when Raouf said that, it was like the sporting world was turned upside down. I mean, this was the era of Michael Jordan and Republicans buy sneakers too, and you're not supposed to say anything about politics and sports. And here's Raouf violating what Howard Cosell called rule number one of the jockocracy, this idea that sports and politics should always remain separate. And when he said it, I mean, ESPN was like, Raouf spits on the flag, booyah, dan -dan 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 -dan. And I was watching this with rapt attention. Like, oh my God, like it was like every single light bulb in my head was going off because like many of you in here, I was a student activist, very, very serious. I was also the McAllister College sports trivia champion. McAllister in the house, anybody? There we go. So you should know that. And you got McAllister sports royalty here with my... <laughs> Yeah, sort of. And yeah, <laughs> and it's, yeah, we don't have much of it at all. The fighting Scots. Uh, that's really what we're called. Um, and, and so all of this was like blowing up in my head at the time, like, like, wow, sports and politics. And so I immediately went about trying to understand this history of sports and politics, which I found was a very hidden history. And the part that I first got my head around, which I think applies to so much journalism beyond sports, is that the history of sports and politics is not a history of the great individual, but it's a history of the mass. It's not the history of these people they make movies about, like Jackie Robinson or Muhammad Ali. It's the history of the people around them and how they influence these athletes to then magnify and electrify those struggles. And one example of that is Jackie Robinson. Like, how many people here have seen the movie 42? I just, wow, Bree, you saw 42? Not a sports fan, but still? watching those sports, you see, but that's the thing. It's, and there are 42 things at least wrong with the movie 42, um, not the least of which is that it decontextualizes Jackie Robinson and makes it seem like he came down from Planet Awesome to somehow integrate Major League Baseball. And what you don't learn from that story was that in the 1930s, there was a mass movement in this country to actually integrate Major League Baseball, that it was integrated um, into the labor movement and the radical struggles of that day. And the Daily Worker, which was the newspaper of the Communist Party, they had a sports editor uh, by the name of Lester Red Rodney. And Lester Rodney reported upon and organized uh, struggles around this issue. And we, we were having all these discussions about objectivity and what that means when you're a reporter. This is what Lester Rodney would do. He actually had a, a press pass where he could go into the dugout after games. And one day at Yankee Stadium, uh, there was a young ball player there named Joe DiMaggio. And someone from the New York Times asked Joe DiMaggio, hey, Joe, who's the best pitcher you've ever faced? And Joe DiMaggio, just, you know, it's a teenage kid, just thought to himself and he said out loud, well, I can I think that would have to be Satchel Page in the Winter League. You know, that Satchel Page was really good. Satchel Page, of course, is a Negro League legend. And when he said that, you could have heard a pin drop in that dugout. Uh, next day, New York Times didn't run anything about it. None of the newspapers ran anything about it whatsoever. It was like Joe DiMaggio didn't even say it, except in the Daily Worker, where Lester Rodney put in a huge font, DiMaggio says Page is best, integrate baseball now, exclamation point, exclamation point. And that, those are the sort of things that Lester Rodney would do. There would be open tryouts at Yankee Stadium, which they would do as a public relations ploy, and Lester Rodney would come out and bring black ball players from the neighborhood to try out and actually dare the Yankees to keep them off the field. They did petition drives. They used their newspaper as an organizing center to integrate the game. And I know all this because I was able to interview Lester Rodney at great length. He lived to be 94 years old, and I'll never forget sitting with him across his little table uh, right outside of Oakland, California, and asking him all the questions about what he did to organize and how he used sports as a tool to fight against racial oppression and white supremacy in this country very consciously. And at one point he looked at me and he said, why do you even care? Why do you care about any of these stories? And I said to him, well, because I think at some point, I don't know when, there's gonna be a new generation of activist athletes who stand up and we need to know this history because if we don't know our history, we're condemned to repeat it. We don't have to recreate the wheel because you actually built something that people can then stand upon. And I believe that these athletes will wanna know this story. I believe young people will wanna know these stories. I believe journalists will wanna know these stories. And Lester Rodney looked at me and he said, ah, to be 80 again, which I always thought was very cute. And so, so that's the context of Jackie Robinson. The other thing we don't learn about whatsoever is that Jackie Robinson wasn't just this person 
who integrated Major League Baseball, but he was a barnstorming speaker for civil rights in his own right. Uh, Dr. King called him a sit-inner before sit-ins, a freedom rider before freedom rides. And Dr. King said that as a defense of Jackie Robinson because people were telling him sports and politics don't mix, don't speak about civil rights, don't speak about the fight for desegregation, don't speak about Jim Crow. But Jackie Robinson did anyway. And uh, uh, he was actually, according to the NAACP's records, their most requested speaker. So when you had uh, like, the, like the, the civil rights troops, the forces on the ground, the, the armies of resistance, when they needed to organize, they called upon Jackie Robinson to come and speak. He was their number one most requested speaker. The number two most requested speaker was someone you might have heard of named Martin Luther King. And I always find that kind of amusing because you imagine people trying to organize an event and they say, can you get Jackie Robinson? Oh, he's busy. All right, let's get Dr. King. God, I can't believe. <laughs> We got to get Dr. King. It's unbelievable. But that's who Jackie Robinson was. And he would always end his speeches by saying, if I had to choose between the Baseball Hall of Fame and full citizenship for my people, I would choose full citizenship time and again. And Jackie Robinson also said at the end of his life, 1972, he said, I will never stand for the national anthem and I will never stand for the flag because I am a black man in this country, and whether the year is 1919, 1947, or 1972, I know that I never had it made. That's the Jackie Robinson that you don't hear about. What's that? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you like that? But it's just like, but it's like Colin. Yeah, but it, and, and it's so crazy. You hear, and we, and so, so this is the two prongs, and I, I think this applies to far more than sports of knowing this history of the mass is like, first of all, you got to revive the history of the people whose um, incisor teeth, if you will, were extracted by the dentists of official history, taking out the sharp edges and the struggle. But you also have to know about the people then they also choose to bury. Because we know about Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. but do we know about Rose Robinson? No relation to Jackie Robinson whatsoever. Rose Robinson was a black woman in 1959 who was a star high jumper. And at the Penn Relays in 1959, Rose Robinson was asked to stand for the national anthem. And she said no, because she said it's 1959, there is a nuclear buildup going on between the US and Russia, and I'm not gonna support weapons of mass destruction. And she took a seat. And we don't hear about Rose Robinson, and we barely hear about Jackie Robinson, or we hear a, what I think, would be called a Santa Clausification of Jackie Robinson. You know, and this, this kind of history applies also very strongly to another icon soon, at, soon thereafter by the name of Muhammad Ali. I mean, we hear about Muhammad Ali. We hear, like, you know, you, you hear like footage of him saying things like, you know, I hospitalized a rock, I beat up a brick, I'm so bad I make medicine sick. Ah, and people say, oh, he rhymes, how interesting. And, but, what, but what you don't hear about whatsoever is the impact that the 1960s had on this individual. And if the 1960s don't happen, Muhammad Ali is Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr., whose dream in life, his dream in life at age 18, was to bring the showmanship of professional wrestling into boxing. And his heroes were not people like Malcolm X or Stokely Carmichael or Dr. King. His hero was a pro wrestler named Gorgeous George Wagner. And this Ali is somebody who we don't hear about. It's, once again, it's this idea that he came down from Planet Awesome with one foot in the black freedom struggle and one foot in the anti-war movement, when in reality there was a context, when in reality there was a mood around him that had this person who barely got an education growing up in Louisville who would be able to stand in front of the New York Times and say, why should they ask me to go 10,000 miles from home and bomb brown people in Vietnam while so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs? These are the days when such evils must come to an end. I've been told to do this. I would risk my freedom. I would risk my money. But I've said it once, and I'll say it again. The real enemy of my people is here. I'll go to jail. So what? We've been in jail for 400 years. That's Muhammad Ali. And he said that because he felt it and because he heard it in the streets. And that's how it entered his heart, and that's how it entered his mind. And that's also how it entered the memory of black America in a way that it does not enter the mainstream media. And I saw this firsthand when I went to Muhammad Ali's funeral uh, the year before last. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And because to go to that funeral, I mean, it, thousands upon thousands of working class and poor black families from the southeast of the United States descended upon Louisville 
to stand in the streets while a citywide caravan of limousines came across. And as soon as I got to Louisville, I said, you know what, the story is not Bill Clinton speaking at this funeral. The story is the thousands of people who have come. And so instead of going inside where I could have gone, I stayed outside for The Nation magazine because I knew that that's where the story was. And it was a, an experience like I've never had. And one of the things about it was you had thousands of people, some of whom were barely alive when Muhammad Ali was in his heyday in the 60s, or not alive at all, and they're chanting, Ali, Ali, as, as the entire procession goes by. And one of the cool things was, um, Will, I, I gotta tell this little story, is that, but this is part of what you, you'd miss if you were just inside, is that Will Smith, was a part of the, the procession. And Will Smith was leaning out of the car of one of the limousines, like past his waist. And he's giving high fives to everybody. And I have audio tape of, how, of what this sounded like. It was like this. It was like, because remember, the cars are going by. And it was like, Ali, Ali. Oh, shit, Will Smith. Ali, <laughs> Ali. And, and later, um, and again, this didn't get national publicity at all, but Will Smith later was asked, like why he leaned out of the car and gave all these people high fives, asked by a local reporter. And I was, I was privy to be able to hear this. And Will Smith talked about uh, when he was filming the movie Ali almost 20 years ago. And uh, Ali was there on the set, uh, very incapacitated by Parkinson's disease, but he was still able to grab Will Smith by the arm. And he said to him, Will, we got to go take the bus. And Will Smith looked at him and he said, I can't take the bus, I'm the Fresh Prince. If I get on the bus, I'm going to be mobbed by people. I can't take the bus. And he looked at him and he said, Will, sometimes you got to let the people touch you so they know you're real. And that's a story. That's a, there's a story there that otherwise would not be told. And that story is seen throughout the history of sports. And it's one that we need to tell and one that we need to continue to tell. And I would make the case that we could tell the history of LGBTQ liberation in this country. We could tell the history of black women in this country. We could tell the history of the feminist movement in this country and do it all through the lens of sports. This movie came out just last year with Billie Jean King, uh, with Emma Stone as Billie Jean. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah, not a lot of people saw that movie. It was Emma Stone and, uh, and the boss from The Office as Bobby Riggs playing against each other. Um, in the famed Battle of the Sexes match in 1972, and uh, Michael Scott, yeah. And the, and the, but the part that that movie did not tell, the part that the, that movie would not tell, was the fact that Billie Jean King existed because there was a women's liberation movement and that Billie Jean King herself was deeply influenced by the black freedom struggle and the black freedom struggle in sports and felt like she could do what she did precisely because there was a movement for black liberation and she felt like this, this was something that women needed to do. The other thing you didn't hear about in that movie at all was that Billie Jean King lent herself to a full page ad where the heading was simply, I had an abortion and she put her name under that. I mean, the bravery that she displayed then, that she continued to display in the fight for Title IX in this country, some of the most significant legislation for women's rights that we've ever had passed, that was signed by Richard Nixon. So you have to draw one of two conclusions. Either Richard Nixon was the biggest down low feminist in the history of the White House, <laughs> or there was a mass movement that made him do what he did, and sports were at the front of that movement. Fast forward to today, people may know about Jason Collins, who's the first openly gay player to play for a major sports team in the United States. Jason Collins took number 98. And you, know, you would see him on the court wearing number 98. And you don't ask the question, why is he wearing number 98? What's that about? He was wearing number 98 because that's the year that Matthew Shepard was killed. And, it was a, it was, and he wanted that represented on the court. Those are the things we don't hear about. And of course, uh, the thing that I've been writing about the most over the last couple of years is the way the Black Lives Matter movement has collided with sports. And I think one of the ways the media has gotten this so very wrong is that they look at people like Colin Kaepernick and they think, as much as I respect and love Colin, that he's somehow leading the movement. And that's just not the case. The people, there would not be a Black Lives Matter movement without the heroism of black women, straight up. And 
but that heroism has a ripple effect that's profound that then hits people like Colin Kaepernick and has them take a knee and say things like, I'm going to continue taking a knee uh, as long as police officers are allowed to get away with murder. You know, and the, those kinds of statements, like what did Colin say? He said, I don't want any more Sandra Blands. I don't want any more Michael Browns. I don't want any more hashtags. I want us to be able to actually live free in this society. And that's cost Colin Kaepernick his job. That's cost him his ability to make a living. But what it's done is inspire a new generation of athletes to stand up. And one of the things I've been covering is the way you've seen this movement ricochet. And this is not something you see on ESPN, but in high schools, in middle schools, in football, in soccer, cheerleading. There was a school marching band that played the national anthem and they all took a knee while they were playing the national anthem. One of the people who took a knee had a zousaphone. You know what a zousaphone is? I mean, that's more athletic than anything you'll ever see on a field. This person was like, and the home of the brain. And that's the remarkable thing that's out there. So when we look at the mass, when we look at the struggles that are taking place around these athletes, we get the real story. And I would argue that that analysis of media and how it works is something that extends well beyond the world of sports. So I hope that everybody in this room becomes people's journalists. Uh, because there's nothing more rewarding than telling the story of ordinary people who provoke pe other people to do extraordinary things. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I don't want to go on too long. And okay, we have time for some questions. So if anyone would like to just line up at the mics, we, we, we're having you at the mics as we're recording this. It's hard to get the questions if you're just speaking from your seat. So anyone? I could always tell more stories, but I don't. Hi, uh, thank you, my name is Aaron. Hey, Aaron. I really enjoyed your comments. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask what's it like writing about uh, a topic like sports that isn't inherently viewed by the public as political? Mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, just what's your approach to you know, in inserting that? Yeah, I mean, until recent years, it was a real struggle. I mean, as Peter referenced, I mean, it was, it was lonely. And it was this, and it was this idea of, of me saying, hey, wait a minute, there's something political about, for example, stadium funding about the Olympics, about the World Cup. There's a political story here. There's even a political story in athletes doing little things, like just branching out, like when President Obama was elected, uh, Carmelo Anthony saying that he was gonna score 44 points in honor of the 44th president and saying that before a game. He only scored 29, which I don't think was a, a Woodrow Wilson tribute, but um, I'm gonna make that case that that wasn't his intention, but, but just any time um, an athlete would say something political, like I would take one tiny little quote and turn it into like a 650-word article. And sometimes it really was a stretch and sometimes it was a reach, but it was still important because it was holding on to that tradition, what Howard Bryant in his recent book calls the heritage of athletic struggle. And anything that kept the heritage alive was something I was gonna write about. In recent years, that, that little flame has of course become an inferno um, across the world of sports. Um, whether you're talking about not just the Black Lives Matter movement, but the Me Too movement, uh, and you see the way that sports has this power to amplify these different struggles. And now, not just uh, left-wing websites, uh, like Think Progress, for example, having a sports, a regular sports beat and things like that, but, um, but also you see mainstream outlets like ESPN, SB Nation, uh, realizing that the big picture actually is the story. Like it's not just about statistics, it's not just about uh, what J.R. Smith does or doesn't do in terms of knowing how much time is left in a game, um, to use one example. But, 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 it, but it's also very much about very fundamentally how sports operates as a national language in our society and, uh, and how we can decode that language for a popular audience. Thanks. Thank you. And I just say really quickly is like when I started, like the pond was, was so small and now it's really big. And I've had people ask me that, like, is it a good thing or a bad thing that there are more people doing the kind of work you're doing? And I think it's, it's fantastic. And it's terrific, particularly uh, women, people of color, like LGBTQ, like OutSports, which is a terrific website about LGBTQ people in sports. Um, it just, it, it's an amazing thing that's happening. And so I want to encourage anybody here, if you're thinking about a career in journalism, to not overlook sports. Hi, I'm Hi. Ryan. Loved your comments. Thank you for all oh. of those stories and anecdotes. They were fantastic and amazing. Um, 
I'm a big hockey fan. I don't know how much you cover like the NHL, but I was wondering um, how much room for acti activism do you think there is in hockey, seeing as it's such a white sport and mm -hmm. it's such a, a privileged sport. You need money to play hockey, and uh, it's very like old time hockey. Like people want to go back to the old days. And what do you think about activism in hockey? Yeah, the, the, the hockey also ahead of the curve of every sport on LGBTQ issues, really through the efforts of one family, the Burke family and people can, can read about them, where um, uh, this famous general manager in hockey, uh, his son was openly gay, and so he and his kids, they, they made it their mission to, um, to start these different organizations to make sure that uh, the locker room is a safe space for LGBTQ athletes, and the NHL has the most progressive policy now mm -hmm. on LGBTQ issues, so I think there's a lot of um, room in hockey, uh, but players have to then not only step up and take that room, but it also takes having, and this is, I think, a theme throughout the day, it takes significant movements off the ice to be able to give players the confidence to feel like they have an audience to be able to express themselves. And so, so I mean, a mass movement in Canada would help, for example, right. um, in hockey. But, but I think that it's, it's there to happen in every sport right now. Um, this is not a hockey thing, but when I interviewed uh, Brianna Stewart, who's a terrific basketball player, um, and she was the first athlete to come forward with a Me Too story, the first prominent athlete, I think the first athlete, period, to, um, after all the Weinstein stuff broke, all the horrors of, of Harvey Weinstein, and she came forward with her own Me Too story, and I interviewed her afterwards, and it was, we, we had it on the Nation podcast, it was the only interview she did, other than putting up her statement on the Players' Tribune, and um, when I asked her what inspired her to do it, and she mentioned the Me Too movement, but she also mentioned Colin Kaepernick. And so the, these struggles can be connected across sports lines in a way that I think is very threatening to the powers that be in sports, but also very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren. Um, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank um, you, so I guess I'm wondering, so now obviously with the Kaepernick stuff, like we're talking a lot about sports and politics, but you've been doing this work for a long time. So how was it before the Kaepernick stuff? You know, were people ever kind of doubting you? Like, oh, like you're reaching too much. This isn't yeah. political. Like you're making this up. Like how did you deal with that backlash? Uh, yeah, there, there, that, was, that was definitely there. Um, the, the best way I dealt with it was by trying to reach out historically. Um, like people might be familiar with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Uh, and I could talk about John Carlos forever because he's one of my dear friends. I did a book with John Carlos and told his story um, called The John Carlos Story, the sports moment that changed the world, if people want to check that out. And, and, um, and I got to know like members of Muhammad Ali's family and, um, and trying to track down um, all the folks from that generation of the 1960s because that at least gave it some weight. You know what I'm saying? Like, like to speak about the history. So when people said, oh, you're reaching or, oh, the heritage doesn't exist anymore. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, this generation of people from the 60s, they're still alive and they still believe in what they did. And Nike may be a powerful company, but they're not powerful enough to silence voices. And part of what I wrote about and part of what I learned from talking to them is this question again of the mass and then sports and learning about how all these folks uh, were actually inspired by people whose names we do not know. And so the faith that I had, if we can call it faith, was that struggles would rise again and that they would impact the world of sports. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Amber. I really Hi, Amber. appreciate your comments today. I follow all the stuff you do, so I'm a big fan. Um, you, were, you were one of the serious sports fans when I asked that. Yeah. yeah I appreciated that. Thank you. Um, is there a certain kind of like disadvantage to having people want to step on eggshells when it comes to athletes not activating that athlete activism kind of side to them? Like, do you take what you can get or do you kind of still ask those questions to those who are silent on the issues? I think it all depends on the times. Uh, but like, for example, in these recent times uh, with the ways in which we could call it this Kaepernick moment, um, even though I got to say, again, the first people to protest during the anthem were actually women in the WNBA. But we call it the Kaepernick moment. It's how it's often referred to. But it's, it's amazing how that's where it starts. And that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I think it starts by, by asking the questions. And one question that I do a radio show in D.C. Uh, with a former basketball player named Etan Thomas who played for 10 years in the NBA. And one of the things that we, anytime we have a, a black athlete, we always save room to ask questions of just asking them, can you talk to us about interactions with the police that you've had in your life? 
And so people's own experiences um, being an athlete in this country, going through the NCAA mill, if you will, uh, is, is, is something that has a politicizing effect. Even if they're told by managers, by family members, by coaches to tamp that stuff down, as a journalist, I think one, I mean, at least in this field, one of the jobs is to try to dredge it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you played in the NCAA, Chris Weber, do, do you think you should have been paid? You know, and you start asking those questions and provoking a response because I think the lived experience of the athlete in this country, particularly the black athlete, particularly the women athlete, particularly the LGBTQ athlete, is inherently politicized. It's one of the, like, there's an old expression, like, you don't have to believe in gravity when you fall out of an airplane. Uh, you know, you're still going to fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same thing with being an athlete because that's not who these games were originally built for. So every time you have... Um, athletes who don't fit the mold of why sp organized sports were created in this country at the turn of the 20th century, which was very much about uh, a white male space, um, what you're doing is, is not, not imposing a political conversation, but, you're, but inspiring and provoking a political conversation that otherwise would not be there. Thank you. Thank you. And anybody can do it. I just want to be so clear about that. It's like people have stories and they want to tell their stories. So oftentimes it takes the simplest of questions to get an absolutely unbelievable response. Another, another favorite of mine that we ask is like, have you ever, what, what is one book that you've read that maybe has compelled you to say what you said? And then they say, I swear nine times out of 10, it's, it's, um, it used to be all the time the autobiography of Malcolm X. And then more recently it's been the new Jim Crow which like athletes are reading this kind of stuff. And so then to be able to then ask them like, well, what did you get out of that? What did you learn out of that? And before you know it, you're not speaking to them. And that's the other thing too, is that athletes actually appreciate that when you give them the space to, because think about this, like if you're a plumber, do you want to be asked about toilets? <laughs> no, you have to, you have to you're, you're, you're deep in toilets all day. That's the last thing you want to talk about. So it's like you're talking to an athlete and it's like, like, do you think J.R. Smith right now wants to talk about what he did last <laughs> night? Like, the last thing he wants to talk about. But if J.R. Smith was here, I would, I would love to talk to him about the fact that um, last year that he took a big step back from where everybody else was standing from the anthem and did his own little protest and ask him about how he felt about that, what he thought could happen, and the ramifications, and how it inspired him. Hi. Hi, my name is Noelle. Hi, Thanks, Noelle. As everyone has said, so much for coming today. Oh. And earlier today and throughout the day, we've discussed a lot about how reporters try to walk that line between advocacy and activism while still maintaining being unbiased, being objective, being neutral, and trying to walk that line and find that balance. Do you think that that is harder when it comes to sports reporting where audiences, especially again, we're talking about Kaepernick and the NFL, mm -hmm. where audiences maybe are more resistant to racial discussions or discussions mm -hmm. of racial tensions and racial progress. Do you find it more difficult in sports reporting? And I know for me immediately, Jamil Hill comes to mind, mm -hmm. who had been suspended for being very outspoken on mm -hmm. social media and on her show about different political issues. And you know, mm -hmm. she suffered the consequences because of that. Um, so in your opinion, do you think that sports reporting presents a unique challenge to that? Mm -hmm. I mean, she suffered the consequences, but that she also just won the NABG, NABJ, yeah. NABJ Journalist of the Year Award. Um, I actually have a, a t-shirt at my house with her face on. I mean, so there, there are, <laughs> which someone made up when she was first suspended and uh, they sent me one, one, of, one of the t-shirts with Jamel's face on it. So th th there, there, there is always a danger to advocacy journalism, but there's also a great danger to being a political athlete. And so, I mean, that's one of the things I try to think about, because there was a discussion earlier today about the reporter being in almost a privileged position when you, when you go speak to people. And I think that we have to surrender that idea and take some of the same risks that the people we're reporting on are taking. And there's no shame in advocacy journalism at all. There's no shame in activist journalism. There's no shame in taking a side. If anything, I think that's one of the places where change comes from. So of course there's an important role for journalism in standing outside and trying to tell a story with a, with a, with a sense of, of even-handed truth. But there, there is also, I think, a very important part of it is taking that risk. And Jamel's consciously taking those risks. 
and that's had a, a real effect on, on others. And it's important, even if people try to silence you, because I think one of the reasons why it matters so much more when, say, Colin Kaepernick does something or Jamel Hill does something, as opposed to, say, if George Clooney does something, is because you get the sense that, well, what's the risk in George Clooney doing something? You know what I'm saying? And it's within that risk that where there's power. And so I think we need to continue to take those risks if we want to see substantive change in this country. Um, and if we want to also earn the trust of people who are also risking their own livelihoods to put themselves out there and speak. That part is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my, oh, hello, am I close enough? Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jordana, um, and I just wanted to say that I'm definitely one of those people that is just like very indifferent to sports, but mm -hmm. for, like, you have made it very interesting and compelling to me. Oh, um, thank you. So I, you know, really appreciate your work. Um, you've mm -hmm. written that for folks who are upset about the way that the NFL has been marginalizing Kaepernick and, you know, uh, the way they've been trying to silence players, that a boycott from outside is not an effective uh, tactic, in your opinion. Um, and so I'm wondering what, for fans, for folks who are watching, um, what's a better way to, you know, show support for the players who are taking a knee or to, you know, show disapproval of um, the NFL trying to squash that protest, if not, like, a, mm. how else to make our, our voices known? Well, actually, no, I, th I think um, a boycott, if organized, can be very effective. Uh, towards the NFL because, you know, when the NFL, the, their recent statements, their recent rules, if people haven't heard about them, is they're now going to fine teams mm -hmm. if players uh, do not, as they put it, stand at respect, that's their terms, uh, for the anthem, and uh, then teams in turn will fine players, um, except for the New York Jets where the owner of the team said that he would pay all the fines, so if players want to protest, they can, uh, which is... Really, which is really something. But one of the things when, when they keep, when they were justifying this idiotic uh, new policy position, one of the things that they kept saying was, we're doing this for our fans, we're doing this for our fans. And what they're not saying, what they should say is, we're doing this for our white fans. And that's what goes unspoken. Because when you talk about, when you see the polls and people say, well, football fans are very polarized around this issue, that's a lie. White fans are polarized around this issue. If you look at statistics of black football fans, uh, they are in support of players having the right to protest. And so overall, the numbers are 60-40 in terms of the latest poll I saw. It's in that 60% that says we don't think players should protest where, I mean, <laughs> that's white fans. And, and so I think like a boycott um, like the NAACP has, has proposed because of the, just the blatant disrespect that they have uh, for black football fans it, it is something that's worth pursuing. And you've heard now about that some NFL players are talking about not playing this year as a form of protest. So all, all, I, to me, it's like every tactic is on the table. The NFL is running itself right now like an alt-right cabal of the Trump administration. And, um, and so I think all, all protest on that front is totally legitimate. Thanks. Thank you. I'm gonna take the mic down. I'm Alyssa. Um, Hi, Alyssa. Thanks for speaking. That oh. conversation really resonated with me as well because um, I was actually a college athlete having to. Oh, what'd you play? Um, track. I ran track. So. Oh. Um, but you kind of touched on this when you talked about the cultural history of America and sports, um, but more on a global scale, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want to speak for all countries, obviously, but I am thinking particularly of soccer in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of European nations, Spain in particular, um, their soccer teams have, are com there's no line between politics and right. soccer. Um, I know during the referendum in Spain, you know, Barcelona was mm -hmm. Catalonia and mm -hmm. Madrid was um, the rest of Spain. And, you know, and that goes back to the Spanish Civil War. I mean, those roots right. run very deep. decades deep in yeah. terms of your political affiliation being connected to this, the soccer team yeah. that you support. But. Exactly. So I was just wondering, in your opinion, um, what is it about American culture and hmm. American sport culture that makes America so different, I guess, from some of those other European hmm. nations? Who well, are. this is the only country on earth that calls our national champions world champions. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, this is 
one of very few countries that actually, very few, I think it's like three, that they do national anthems before sporting events. So you have to pay fealty to the country beforehand. Um, and this, and find another country with cheerleaders. I mean, you're not gonna do it. There's a very particular way that sports, I'm not, nothing against cheerleaders. I'm just pointing, I know, I got all love for the cheerleading community. Unionize, please. Um, <laughs> unionize cheerleaders. I'm just making the point that there are very specific differences um, in how sports operate in this country for two reasons. I mean, the first is that it is right now, like sports coming out of the United States is a, oh, this is also the only country, you gotta say, that loves American football. I mean, it's like they're trying to penetrate Europe, they're trying to develop a, a US football culture in Europe, and I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. You go to those games and it's, uh, it's a lot of US expats and people who wandered over there from the, the hash bar in Amsterdam to watch a game. It's not serious at all the way, it's, the way soccer is serious. Um, my friend who's uh, from Puerto Rico, he said, uh, they call US football, they call it, they say, we have football, and he means soccer, and there's football imperialismo. And he said, and that's football. And so when we talk about, and he said, even people who are fans, like, like they say, who's your favorite football imperialismo team? It's like, oh, I like, you know, I, I like the Jets or whatever. And that's my favorite football imperialismo team. And, and so, so it, I think two reasons. One has, has everything to do with, with US hegemony. And the fact that, I mean, you, you, if you're going to have a country like the United States, which is uh, the most powerful country that the world has ever known, economically, militarily, imperially, um, its sports culture is going to reflect that dramatically. And so I think that's what has always distorted and warped sports culture in this country, going back to its very beginnings, when the original aim of baseball, one of the founders of baseball was a guy named Albert Spaulding. People might have heard of Spaulding Sporting Goods. And he delivered this famous speech called Baseball is War, which was all about how baseball was going to be used to, to settle, quote unquote, the, the Caribbean around the United States. So this has always existed. And, but that's, again, like what makes it so electric when athletes do protest within this space, because it is this very conservative space. And when you have uh, people stand up to that, um, you're also connecting with a lot of fans who love sports but hate so much of what comes with it. Thank you. Well, thank you. And Can you all please join me oh. in thanking Dave? For oh. Um, thanks. I wanna, I wanna you have a, did you want to sum up things? In a I got nothing to sum up. I just I think um, I love coming to this because it's really inspiring. And uh, I, I loved my, my breakout group before. And I hope everybody keeps can doing the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you. Oh, we got Melissa. Um, yes, one, one, we have one time for one last question, absolutely. Please. Uh, so um, I don't know if you were in earlier when um, a lot of the young people were um, asking questions about sources. So I know that one of the things you do is you build very long-term relationships. So you sort of glossed over your relationship with John Carlos, for example. Um, one of the reasons you've written these books is because you have very long-term relationships with folks that you have written these texts with. And so one of the conversations that's come up repeatedly over the course of the day has been about being a journalist mm -hmm. um, while also telling the stories of people with whom you have relationships that go beyond mm -hmm. the story. So I wondered if maybe you would share with us a little bit about how you get the story right when you really genuinely adore the yeah. subject of the story. Well, <laughs> it ain't easy. <laughs> That's a terrific question. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's especially when, when, like I said, like I started out like reporting a lot on this older generation of athletes as a way to keep that heritage and that tradition alive. And sometimes folks like to tell some tall tales. And there's the temptation to want to print those without fact checking them because these are their memories and they hold them so dear, but they're memories that have been refracted through time to so many de degrees that the next thing, you know, like I don't want to um, name names, but a very famous person from the 1960s sports scene, I don't want to say their name, but I did a series of long articles um, about them. And then one day we're sitting, hanging out, and I'm just, you know, like Melissa said, I'm adoring this person and we're sitting and talking. And he turns to me and he says, man, this reminds me of that time I smoked some weed with Jimi Hendrix. And I'm just like, what? 
And he said, and he's like talking to me seriously. And he's like, yeah, and then um, you're not going to believe who came in and then just started smoking a little weed with us. But it was, uh, you know, Bob Marley. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> you're just saying this to me casually right now. And I got to say, there is no way this story was true. There is no way that he was smoking weed with Jimi Hendrix and Bob Marley and that he would only tell me this for the first time after we'd known each other for a number of years. And so I wasn't going to go to Peter and then Katrina and be like, I've got this amazing weed story we're going to run in the nation. We would have run it. You would have run it. <laughs> but, but, it's, it's, um, but it's just to say that it, it, it's, it's difficult. It really is difficult because building relationships over time, I mean, it takes building trust, but sometimes you really do, particularly when dealing with older generations of folks, you have to protect your sources sometimes from themselves and make sure that they're telling a story that's true and that's verifiable because the per people, you, you'll pay a price for that as a journalist, but they'll pay an even deeper price if it's found out they're not telling the truth. So I think that's part of the responsibility, we could call it the responsibility of adoration, is that you want to also protect the people you care about from themselves. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.